A Treatise on Prayer by John Knox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Declaration What True Prayer Is, How We Should Pray, and For What We Should Pray, set forth by John Knox, Preacher of God's Holy Word. Unto the small and dispersed flock of Jesus Christ. How necessary is the right invocation of God's name, otherwise called perfect prayer. It becomes no Christian to misknow, seeing it is the very branch which springs forth of true faith, whereof, if any man be destitute, notwithstanding he is endued with whatsoever other virtues, yet in the presence of God is he considered as no Christian at all. Therefore it is a manifest sign that such as are always negligent in prayer do understand nothing of perfect faith, for if the fire be without heat, or the burning lamp without light, then true faith may be without fervent prayer. But because in times past there was, and yet, alas, there still is, no small number who reckon that to be prayer which in the sight of God was and is nothing less, I intend shortly to touch upon the circumstances thereof. What prayer is who will pray must know and understand that prayer is an earnest and familiar talking with God, to whom we declare our miseries, whose help we implore and desire in our adversities, and whom we laud and praise for our benefits received. So that prayer contains the exposition of our dullers, footnote, troubles, sorrows, end footnote, the desire of God's defence and the praising of his magnificent name, as the Psalms of David clearly teach what is to be observed in prayer. The consideration in whose presence we stand, to whom we speak, and what we desire should excite us to the greatest reverence in doing this, standing in the presence of the omnipotent Creator of heaven and earth, and of all that is therein, whom a thousand thousand angels assist and serve, giving obedience to His eternal majesty, and speaking unto Him, who knoweth the secrets of our hearts, before whom dissimulation and lies are always odious and hateful, and asking those things which may be most to his glory and to the comfort of our conscience. But we should attend diligently that such things as may offend his godly presence may be removed to the uttermost of our power. And first, that worldly cares and fleshly cogitations, such as draw us from contemplation of our God, be expelled from us, that we may freely, without interruption, call upon God. But how difficult and hard this one thing is to perform in prayer, none know better than such as in their prayers are not content to remain within the bands of their own vanity, but are, as it were, enwrapped and do intend to a purity allowed of God, asking not such things as the foolish reason of man desires, but that which may be pleasant and acceptable in God's presence. Our adversary Satan, at all times compassing us about is never more busy than when we address and bend ourselves to prayer. Oh, how secretly and subtly he creeps into our breasts, and, calling us back from God, causes us to forget what we have to do. So that frequently, when we with all reverence should speak to God, we find our hearts talking with the vanities of the world, and with the foolish imaginations of our own conceit. How the Spirit maketh intercession for us! so that without the Spirit of God supporting our infirmities, mightily making intercession for us with unceasing groans, which cannot be expressed with tongue, there is no hope that we can desire anything according to God's will. I mean not that the Holy Ghost doth mourn or pray, but that he stirreth up our minds, giving unto us a desire or boldness to pray, and cause us to mourn when we are extracted or pulled therefrom which thing to conceive no strength of man suffices, neither is able of itself. But hereof it is plain, that such as understand not what they pray, or expound, or declare not the desire of their hearts clearly in God's presence, and in time of prayer as far as they are able, and do not expel vain cogitations from their minds, they profit nothing in prayer. Why should we pray, and also understand what we do pray? But some will object and say, Although we understand not what we pray, yet God understandeth, who knoweth the secrets of our hearts. He knoweth also what we need, although we explain not or declare not our necessities unto him. 
Such men verily declare themselves never to have understood what perfect prayer meant, nor to what end Jesus Christ commanded us to pray, which is, first, that our hearts may be inflamed with continual fear, honour, and love of God, to whom we run for support and help, whensoever danger or necessity requires, that we so, learning to mollify our desires in his presence, he may teach us what is to be desired and what not. Also that we, knowing our petitions to be granted by God alone, to whom only we must render and give laud and praise, and that, we ever having his infinite goodness fixed in our minds, may constantly abide to receive that which with fervent prayer we desire. For sometimes God defers or prolongs to grant our petitions, for the exercise and trial of our faith, and not that he sleepeth or is absent from us at any time, but that with more gladness we might receive what with long expectation we have abided for, that thereby we, assured of his eternal providence, so far as the infirmity of our corrupt and most weak nature will permit, doubt not, but that his merciful hand shall relieve us in most urgent necessity and extreme tribulation." Therefore such men as teach us that necessarily it is not required that we understand what we pray, because God knoweth what we need, would also teach us that we neither honour God, nor yet refer or give unto him thanks for benefits received, for how shall we honour and praise him, whose goodness and liberality we know not? And how shall we know unless we receive and sometimes have experience? And how shall we know that we have received, unless we know verily what we have asked. The second thing to be observed in perfect prayer is that standing in the presence of God, we be found such as reverence his holy name, earnestly repenting our past iniquities and intending to lead a new life. For otherwise all our prayers are in vain, as it is written, Whoso withdraweth his ear that he may not hear the law of God, his prayer shall be abominable. Likewise Isaiah and Jeremiah say this, You shall multiply your prayers, and I shall not hear, because your hands are full of blood, that is, of all cruelty and mischievous works. Also the Spirit of God appeareth by the mouth of the blind, whom Jesus Christ illuminated by these words, We know that God heareth not sinners, that is, such as do glory and continue in iniquity so that of necessity true repentance must needs be had and go before perfect prayer or sincere invocation of god's name and unto these two things must be annexed the third which is the dedication of ourselves in god's presence utterly refusing and casting off our own justice with all cogitations and opinions thereof and let us not think that we shall be heard for anything proceeding purely of our own mind or depend anything upon our own justice which from the presence of his mercy repelleth or holdeth with the high proud Pharisee, and therefore we find the most holy men most dejected and humbled in prayer. David saith, O Lord our Saviour, help us, be merciful to our sins for thy own sake, remember not our old iniquities, but haste thee, O Lord, and let thy mercy prevent us. Jeremiah saith, If our iniquities bear testimony against us, do thou according to thy own name. And behold, Isaiah, thou art angry, O Lord, because we have sinned, and are replenished with all wickedness, and our justice is like a defiled cloth. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are clay, thou art the workman, and we the workmanship of thy hands. Be not angry, O Lord, remember not our iniquities for ever. And Daniel, greatly commended of God, in his prayer made most humble confession in these words, We are sinners, and have offended, we have done ungodly, and fallen from thy commandment, therefore not in our own righteousness make we our prayers before thee, but thy most rich and great mercies bring we forth for us. O Lord, hear, O Lord, be merciful and spare us, O Lord, attend, help, and cease not, my God, even for thy own name's sake, do it, for thy city and thy people are called after thy own name. Observe that in these prayers is no mention of their own justice, their own satisfaction, or their own merits, but most humble confession proceeding from a sorrowful and penitent heart, having nothing whereupon it might depend but the sure mercy of God alone, who had promised to be their God, that is, their help, comfort, defender, and deliverer, as he hath also done to us by Jesus Christ in time of tribulation." and therefore they despaired not but after the acknowledging of their sins called for mercy and obtained the same 
Wherefore it is plain that such men as in their prayers have respect to any virtue proceeding of themselves, thinking their prayers are accepted thereby, never prayed aright. What fasting and alms deeds are without prayer. And although to fervent prayer are joined fasting, watching, and alms deeds, yet are none of these the cause that God will accept our prayers, but they are spurs which make us not to vary, but make us more able to continue in prayer which the mercy of God doth accept. But here it may be observed that David prayeth, Keep my life, O Lord, for I am holy. O Lord, save my soul, for I am innocent, and suffer me not to be confounded. Also Hezekiah, remember, Lord, I beseech thee, that I have walked righteously before thee, and that I have wrought that which is good in thy sight. These words are not spoken of men out of vainglory, neither yet trusting in their own works, but herein they testify themselves to be the sons of God by regeneration, to whom he promises always to be merciful, and at all times to hear their prayers. The cause of their boldness was Jesus Christ. And so their words spring from a wanted, constant, and fervent faith, surely believing that, as God of his infinite mercy had called them to his knowledge, not suffering them to walk after their own natural wickedness, but had partly taught them to conform themselves to his holy law, and that for the promised seed's sake he would not leave them destitute of comfort, consolation, and defence in so great and extreme necessity, and so they allege not their justice to glory thereof, or to put trust therein, but to strengthen and confirm them in God's promises. And this consolation I would wish all Christians in their prayers, the testimony of a good conscience to assure them of God's promises. But to obtain what they ask must only depend upon Him, all opinion and thought of our own justice being laid aside. And moreover David in the words above compares himself with King Saul, and with the rest of his enemies who wrongfully persecuted him, desiring of God that they prevail not against him, as though he would say, Unjustly do they persecute me, and therefore, according to my innocence, defend me. For otherwise he confesses himself most grievously to have offended God, as in the preceding places he clearly testifies. Hypocrisy is not allowed with God. Thirdly, in prayer is to be observed that what we ask of God that we must earnestly desire, acknowledging ourselves to be indigent and void thereof, and that God alone can grant the petitions of our hearts when it is his good will and pleasure. For nothing is more odious before God than hypocrisy and dissimulation, that is, when men do ask of God things whereof they have no need, or that they believe to obtain by others than by God alone. As if a man ask of God the remission of his sins, thinking nevertheless to obtain the same by his own works, or by other men's merits, he mocks God and deceives himself. And in such cases a great number do offend, principally the mighty and rich of the earth, who for a common custom will pray this part of the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, that is, a moderate and reasonable sustenance, and yet their own hearts will testify that they need not so to pray, seeing they abound in all worldly solace and felicity. I mean not that rich men should not pray this part of the Lord's Prayer, but I would they understood what they ought to pray in it, whereof I intend to speak afterwards, and that they ask nothing whereof they feel not themselves marvellously indigent and needy, for unless we call in verity he will not grant, and except we speak with our whole heart, we shall not find him. The fourth rule necessary to be followed in prayer is a sure hope to attain what we ask, for nothing more offends God than when we ask doubting whether he will grant our petitions, for in so doing we doubt if God be true, and if he be mighty and good. Such, saith St. James, can obtain nothing of God, and therefore Jesus Christ commands that we firmly believe to obtain whatsoever we ask, for all things are possible to him that believeth. And therefore, in our prayers, desperation always is to be expelled. I mean not that any man in extremity of trouble can be without a present duller, and without a greater fear of trouble to follow. Trouble and fear are the very spurs to prayer, for when man compassed about with vehement calamities and vexed with continual solicitude, having by help of man no hope of deliverance, with sorely oppressed and punished heart, fearing also greater punishment to follow, 
doth call to God for comfort and support from the deep pit of tribulation, such prayer ascendeth into God's presence and returneth not in vain. God delivereth his chosen from their enemies. As David, in the vehement persecution of Saul, hunted and chased from every hold, fearing that one day or other he should fall into the hands of his persecutors, after he had complained that no place of rest was left to him, vehemently prayed, saying, O Lord, which art my God, in whom only I trust, save me from them that persecute me, and deliver me from mine enemies. Let not this man, meaning Saul, devour my life as a lion doth his prey, for of none seek I comfort but of thee alone. In the midst of these anguishes the goodness of God sustained him, so that the present tribulation was tolerable, and the infallible promises of God so assured him of deliverance that his fear was partly mitigated and gone, as plainly appears to such as diligently mark the process of his prayers. For after long menacing and threatening made to him by his enemies, he concludes with these words, The dollar which he intended to me shall fall upon his own pate, and the violence wherewith he would have oppressed me shall cast down his own head. But I will magnify the Lord according to his justice, and shall praise the name of the Most High. This is not written for David only, but for all such as shall suffer tribulation to the end of the world. For I, the writer hereof, let this be said to the praise and Lord of God alone, in anguish of mind and vehement tribulation and affliction, called to the Lord, when not only the ungodly, but even my faithful brethren, yea, and my own self, that is, all natural understanding, judged my cause to be irremediable. Footnote. Knox here alludes to his severe confinement on board the French galleys. End footnote. And yet, in my greatest calamity, and when my pains were most cruel, his eternal wisdom would that my hands should write far contrary to the judgment of carnal reason, but which his mercy hath proved true. Blessed be his holy name. And therefore I dare be bold in the verity of God's word to promise that, notwithstanding the vehemence of trouble, the long continuance thereof, the desperation of all men, the fearfulness, danger, dolour, and anguish of our own hearts, yet if we call constantly to God, beyond the expectation of all men, he shall deliver. Let no man think himself unworthy to call and pray to God, because he hath grievously offended his majesty in times past, but let him bring to God a sorrowful and repenting heart, saying with David, Heal my soul, O Lord, for I have offended against thee. Before I was afflicted, I transgressed, but now let me observe thy commandments." To mitigate or ease the sorrows of our wounded consciences, our most prudent physician hath provided two plasters to give us encouragement to pray, notwithstanding the knowledge of offences committed, that is, a precept and a promise. The precept or commandment to pray is universal, frequently inculcated and repeated in God's scriptures. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Call upon me in the day of trouble. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. I command that ye pray ever without ceasing, make deprecations incessantly, and give thanks in all things. The commandment is, Whoso contemns or despises prayer, sins equally with him that doth steal. For as this commandment, Thou shalt not steal, is a precept negative, so thou shalt pray is a precept affirmative, and God requires equal obedience of all and to all his commandments. Yet more boldly will I say, he who, when necessity constrains, desires not support and help of God, provokes his wrath no less than such as make false gods or openly deny God. Whoso prayeth not in tribulation denieth God. For like as it is to know no physician or medicine, or in knowing them to refuse to use and receive the same, so not to call upon God in thy tribulation is as if thou didst not know God, or else utterly denied him. Not to pray is sin most odious. Oh, why cease we then to call instantly to his mercy, having his commandments so to do, above all our iniquities? We work manifest contempt and despising of him, when, by negligence, we delay to call for his gracious support. Whoso doth call upon God, obeys his will, and finds therein no small consolation, knowing that nothing is more acceptable to his majesty than humble obedience. To his commandment he addeth his most undoubted promise in many places. 
Ask and ye shall receive, seek and ye shall find. And by the prophet Jeremiah God saith, Ye shall call upon me, and I shall hear you. Ye shall seek, and ye shall find me. And by Isaiah he saith, The father may forget his natural son, and the mother her own child. And although they do, yet shall I not forget such as call upon me. And here too the words of Jesus Christ correspond and agree, saying, If ye, being wicked, can give good gifts to your children, much more my heavenly Father shall give the Holy Ghost to them that ask him. And that we should not think God to be absent, or not to hear us, observeth Moses, saying, There is no nation that have their gods so adherent, or near unto them as our God, who is present at all our prayers. Also the psalmist, Near is the Lord to all that call upon him in verity. And Christ saith, Wheresoever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. The readiness of God to hear sinners, that we should not think God does not hear us, Isaiah saith, Before ye cry, I shall hear, and while they yet speak, I shall answer. And also, if at even come sorrow or calamity, before the morning spring, I shall reduce and bring gladness. And these most comfortable words doth the Lord speak not to Israel after the flesh only, but to all men sorely oppressed, abiding God's deliverance. For a moment and a little season have I turned my face from thee, but in everlasting mercy shall I comfort thee. The hope to obtain our petitions should depend upon the promises of God. O oh, hard are the hearts whom so manifold, most firm and sure promises do not mollify, whereupon should depend the hope to obtain our petitions. The indignity or unworthiness of ourselves is not to be regarded, for although in holiness and purity of life we are far inferior to the chosen which are departed, yet in that respect we are equal, in that we have the same commandment to pray and the same promise to be heard. For our gracious God esteems not the prayer, neither grants the petition for any dignity of the person that prayeth, but for his promise sake only. And therefore saith David, Thou hast promised unto thy servant, O Lord, that thou wilt build a house for him, wherefore thy servant hath found in his heart to pray in thy sight, now even so. O Lord, thou art God, and thy words are true, Thou hast spoken these good things unto thy servant. Begin, therefore, to do according to thy promise, the household of thy servant. Behold, David altogether depended upon God's promise, as also did Jacob, after he had confessed himself unworthy of all the benefits received, yet dare he boldly ask greater benefits in times subsequent, and that because God had promised. In the like manner let us be encouraged to ask whatsoever the goodness of God hath freely promised, what we should principally ask, we shall hereafter declare. Observation in Godly Prayer The first observation which godly prayer requires is the perfect knowledge of the Advocate, Intercessor, and Mediator. Of necessity we must have a Mediator, for seeing no man is of himself worthy to compare or appear in God's presence by reason that sin continually remaineth in all men, which by itself doth offend the majesty of God, raising also debate, strife, and division betwixt his inviolable justice and us, for the which, unless satisfaction be made by another than by ourselves, so little hope remaineth that we can attain anything from him, that we can have no surety with him at all. To exempt us from this horrible confusion, our most merciful Father has given unto us his only beloved Son, to be unto us justice, wisdom, sanctification, and holiness." If in him we faithfully believe, we are so clad that we may with boldness appear before the throne of God's mercy. Doubting not, but whatsoever we ask by our mediator, we shall obtain most assuredly that same. Here is most diligently to be observed that without our mediator, forespeaker, and peacemaker, we enter not into prayer, for the incallings of such as pray without Jesus Christ are not only vain, but also they are odious and abominable before God and which thing in the levitical priesthood was most evidently prefigured and declared for as within the most holy place no man entered but the high priest only and as all sacrifices offered by any other than by priests only provoked the wrath of god upon the sacrifice maker so whoever intends to enter into god's presence or to make prayers without jesus christ shall find nothing but fearful judgment and horrible damnation 
wherewith it is plain that Turks and Jews, notwithstanding they do, apparently most fervently pray unto God, who created heaven and earth, who guideth and ruleth the same, who defendeth the good and punisheth the evil, yet their prayers are never pleasing unto God. Neither honour they his holy majesty in anything, because they acknowledge not Jesus Christ. For whoso honoureth not the Son, honoureth not the Father. When we be not heard. For as the law is a statute that we shall call upon God, and as the promise is made that he shall hear, so are we commanded only to call by Jesus Christ, by whom alone we obtain our petitions. For in him alone are all the promises of God confirmed and complete, whereof without all controversy it is plain that such as have called or do call upon god by any other name than by jesus christ alone nothing regard god's will but obstinately prevaricate and do against his commandments and therefore they obtain not their petitions neither yet have entrance to his mercy for no man cometh to the father saith jesus christ but by me he is the right way whoso declineth from him goes wrong he is our leader, whom, unless we follow, we shall walk in darkness. He alone is our captain, without whom neither praise nor victory shall we ever obtain. Intercession to Saints Again, such as depend upon the intercession of saints, no otherwise will I contend, but will shortly touch the properties of a perfect mediator. First, the words of Paul are most sure, a mediator is not a mediator of one, that is, wheresoever is required a mediator, there are also two parties, to wit, one party offending, and the other party who is offended, which parties in themselves can in no wise be reconciled. Secondly, the mediator which takes upon him the reconciling of these two parties must be such a one as having trust and favour of both parties, yet in some things must differ from both, and must be clear and innocent also of the crime committed against the party offended. Let this be more plain by this subsequent declaration. The eternal God standeth upon the one part, and all natural men descending of Adam upon the other part. The infinite justice of God is so offended with the transgressions of all men, that in no wise can amity be made, except such a one be found as fully may make satisfaction for man's offences. Among the sons of men none was found able, for they all were found criminal in the fault of one, and God's infinite justice must abhor the society and sacrifice of sinners. Angels may not be mediators. And unto the angels what prevailed the prevarication of man, who, even if they would have interposed themselves as mediators, yet they had not the infinite justice. Who then shall here be found the peacemaker? Surely the infinite goodness and mercy of God might not suffer the perpetual loss and repudiation of his creatures, and therefore his eternal wisdom provided such a mediator, having wherewith to satisfy the justice of God, differing also from the Godhead, his only son, clad in the nature of manhood, who interposed himself a mediator, not as man only. Jesus Christ, God and man, is mediator. For the pure humanity of Christ, of itself, might neither make intercession nor satisfaction for us, but God and man. In that he is God, he might complete the will of the Father, and in that he is man, pure and clean, without spot or sin, he might offer sacrifice for the taking away of our sins, and satisfaction of God's justice. So, unless saints have these two, Godhead equal with the Father, and humanity without sin, saints may not usurp the office of mediator. But here will be objected, Who knoweth not Jesus Christ to be the only mediator of our redemption, but that impedes or hinders not saints and holy men to be mediators and to make intercession for us, as though Jesus Christ had been but one hour our mediator, and afterwards had resigned the office unto his servants. Who maketh other mediators than Jesus Christ, taketh honour from him. Do not such men gently, footnote, respectfully, spoken ironically, end footnote, entreat Jesus Christ, detracting from him such portion of his honour. Otherwise the scriptures of God testify him to have been made man, and to have proved our infirmities, to have suffered death willingly, to have overcome the same, and all to this end that he might be our perpetual high sovereign priest, in whose place or dignity none other might enter. 
As John saith, If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the just. Mark well these words. John saith, We have presently a sufficient advocate, whom Paul affirms to sit at the right hand of God the Father, and to be the only mediator between God and man. For he alone, saith Ambrose, is our mouth by whom we speak to God, he is our eyes by whom we see God, and also our right hand by whom we offer anything to the Father, who, unless he make intercession, neither we nor any of the saints may have any society or fellowship with God. What creature may say to God the Father, Let man be received unto thy favour, for the pain of his transgressions I have sustained in my own body. For his cause was I encompassed with all infirmities, and so became the most contemned and despised of all men. And yet in my mouth was found no guile nor deceit, but I was always obedient to thy will, suffering most grievous death for mankind. And therefore behold not the sinner, but me, who by my infinite justice have perfectly satisfied for his offences. May any other Jesus Christ accepted in these words make intercession for sinners? If they may not, then are they neither mediators nor yet intercessors. For although, saith Augustine, Christians do commend one another unto God in their prayers, yet they make not intercession, neither dare they usurp the office of a mediator, not Paul, although under the head he was a principal member, because he commendeth himself to the prayers of faithful men. But if any do object, such is not the condition of the saints departed, who now have put off mortality, and bear no longer the fragility of the flesh, which although I grant to be most true, yet are they all compelled to cast their crowns before him that sitteth on the throne, acknowledging themselves to have been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, and therefore none of them do attempt to be a mediator, seeing they neither have being nor justice of themselves. But in the great light of the gospel which now is beginning, praise be to the omnipotent, it is not necessary upon such matters long to remain. Some say we will use but one mediator, Jesus Christ, to God the Father, but we must have saints, and chiefly the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, to pray for us unto him. Against such as would have mediators to Jesus Christ, Alas, whosoever are so minded show plainly themselves to know nothing of Jesus Christ rightly. Is he who descended from heaven and vouchsafed to be conversant with sinners, commanding all sorely vexed and sick to come unto him, who, hanging upon the cross, prayed first for his enemies, is he become now so untractable that he will not hear us without a person to be a means? O Lord, open the eyes of such that they may clearly perceive thy infinite kindness, gentleness and love towards mankind. Above all these things is to be observed that what we ask of God ought to be profitable to ourselves and to others, and hurtful or dangerous to no man. Secondly, we must also consider whether our petitions extend to spiritual or temporal things. Spiritual things, such as deliverance from impiety, remission of sins, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and of life everlasting we should desire absolutely, without any condition, by Jesus Christ, in whom alone all these are promised. And in asking hereof we should not pray thus, O Father, forgive our sins if thou wilt, for he hath expressed his will, saying, As I live, I desire not the death of a sinner, but rather that he convert and live, which immutable and solemn death, whoso calleth in doubt, maketh God a liar, and so far as in him lies, would spoil him of his Godhead. For he cannot be God except he be eternal and infallible verity. And John saith, This is the testimony which God hath testified of his Son, that whoso believeth in the Son hath eternal life, to the verity whereof we should steadfastly cleave, although worldly duller apprehend us. As David, exiled from his kingdom and deprived of all his glory, secluded not from God, but steadfastly believed reconciliation by the promise made, notwithstanding that all creatures in earth had refused, objected, and rebelled against him. Happy is the man whom thou shalt inspire, O Lord. In asking for temporal things, first let us inquire if we be at peace with God in our conscience by Jesus Christ, firmly believing our sins to be remitted in his blood. Secondly, let us inquire of our own hearts if we know that temporal riches or substance do not come to man by accident, fortune, or chance, 
neither yet by the industry and diligence of man's labour, but they are the liberal gift of God alone, whereof we ought to lord and praise his goodness, wisdom, and providence alone. What should be prayed for? And if we truly acknowledge and confess this, let us boldly ask of him whatsoever is necessary for us, as sustenance of this body, health thereof, defence from misery, deliverance from trouble, tranquillity and peace to our commonwealth, prosperous success in our vocations, labours and affairs, whatsoever they are, which God wills we should ask all of him to certify to us that all things stand in his regimen and disposition and also by asking and receiving these bodily commodities we have a taste of his sweetness and are inflamed with his love, that thereby our faith of reconciliation and remission of our sins may be exercised and increase. But in asking such temporal things we must observe first that if God deferreth or prolongeth to grant our petitions, even so long that he seems apparently to reject us, yet let us not cease to call, prescribing him neither the time nor the manner of deliverance, as it is written, if he prolong time, abide patiently upon him, and also let not the faithful be too hasty, for God sometimes deferreth and will not quickly grant for probation of our continuance, as the words of Jesus Christ testify, and also that we may receive with greater gladness that which with ardent desire we long have looked for, as Hannah, Sarah, and Elizabeth, after their barrenness and sterility, received children with joy. Secondly, because we know the church at all times to be under the cross in asking temporal commodities, and especially deliverance from trouble. Let us offer unto God obedience, if it shall please his goodness we be longer exercised, that we may patiently abide it, as David, desiring to be restored to his kingdom, when he was exiled by his own son, offered unto God obedience, saying, If I have found favour in the presence of the Lord, he shall bring me home again. But if he shall say, Thou pleasest me not longer to bear authority, I am obedient, let him do what seemeth good unto him. Better it is to obey God than men, the three children said to Nebuchadnezzar, We know that our God, whom we worship, may deliver us, but if it shall not please him so to do, let it be known to thee, O king, that we will not worship thy gods. Here they gave a true confession of their perfect faith, knowing nothing was impossible to the omnipotence of God, affirming also themselves to stand in his mercy, for otherwise the nature of man could not willingly give itself to so horrible a torment, but they offer unto God most humble obedience to be delivered at his good will and pleasure, as we should do in all afflictions, for we know not what to ask or desire as we ought, that is, the frail flesh, oppressed with fear and pain, desires deliverance, ever abhorring and drawing back from giving obedience. O Christian brethren, I write by experience, but the Spirit of God calleth back the mind to obedience, that, although it doth desire and abide for deliverance, yet should it not repine against the good will of God, but incessantly ask that it may abide with patience. How hard this battle is, no man knoweth but he who in himself hath suffered trial. It is to be noticed that God sometimes doth grant the petition of the Spirit, while he yet defers the desire of the flesh. The petition of the Spirit. As who doubteth but God did mitigate the heaviness of Joseph, although he sent not hasty deliverance in his long imprisonment, and that he gave him favour in the sight of the jailer, so inwardly also he gave him consolation in spirit, wherein he utterly repels the desire of the flesh, for the petition of the spirit always is that we may attain to the true felicity whereunto we must needs enter by tribulation, and the final death which the nature of man ever abhors, and therefore the flesh under the cross and at the sight of death calls and thirsts for hasty deliverance. But God, who alone knows what is expedient for us, sometimes prolongs the deliverance of his chosen, and sometimes permits them to drink, before the maturity of age, the bitter cup of bodily death, that thereby they may receive medicine and cure from all infirmity. For who doubts that John the Baptist desired to have seen the days of Jesus Christ more, and to have been longer with him in conversation? or that Stephen would not have laboured more days in preaching Christ's gospel, whom nevertheless he suffered speedily to taste of this general sentence, 
and although we see therefore no apparent help to ourselves, nor yet to others who are afflicted, let us not cease to call, thinking that our prayers are vain. For whatsoever come of our bodies, God shall give unspeakable comfort to the spirit, and shall turn all to our good, beyond our own expectation. Impediments come of the weakness of the flesh. The cause why I am so long and tedious in this matter is, for that I know how hard the battle is betwixt the spirit and the flesh under the heavy cross of affliction where no worldly defence but present death doth appear. I know the grudging and murmuring complaints of the flesh, I know the wrath, anger, and indignation which it conceives against God, calling all his promises in doubt and being ready every hour utterly to fall from God, against which only faith remains, provoking us to call earnestly and to pray for assistance of God's Spirit, wherein, if we continue, he shall turn our most desperate calamities to gladness and to a prosperous end. To thee alone, O Lord, be praise, for with experience I write this and speak it, where, for whom, and at what time we ought to pray, is not to be passed over with silence. Private Prayer such prayers as men secretly offer unto God by themselves require no separate place, although Jesus Christ commandeth, when we pray, to enter into our chamber and close the door, and so to pray unto our Father secretly, whereby he would that we should choose for our prayers such places as might offer least occasion to call us back from prayer, and also that we should expel forth from our minds in time of our prayer all vain cogitations, for otherwise Jesus Christ himself doth observe no special place of prayer, for we find him sometimes pray in Mount Olivet, sometimes in the desert, sometimes in the temple and in the garden. And Peter desired to pray upon the top of the house. Paul prayed in prison and was heard of God, who also commandeth men to pray in all places, lifting up to God pure and clean hands, as we find that the prophets and most holy men did, whensoever danger or necessity required. Appointed places to pray in may not be neglected. But public and common prayers should be used in the place appointed for the assembly, from whence whosoever negligently withdraw themselves are in no wise excusable. I mean not that to be absent from that place is sin, because that place is more holy than another, for the whole earth created by God is equally holy. But the promise made that, wheresoever two or three are met together in my name, there shall I be in the midst of them, condemns all such as contemn the congregation gathered in his name. But mark well this word gathered, I mean not to hear piping, singing, or playing, nor to patter upon beads or books whereof they have no understanding, nor to commit idolatry, honouring that for God which is no God indeed. For with such I will neither join myself in common prayer, nor in receiving external sacraments, for in so doing I should affirm their superstition and abominable idolatry, which I by God's grace will never do, nor counsel others to do, to the end. What it is to be gathered in the name of Christ. The congregation which I mean should be gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, that is to lord and magnify God the Father for the infinite benefits they have received by his only Son, our Lord. In this congregation the mystical and last supper of Jesus Christ should be distributed without superstition or any more ceremonies than he himself used and his apostles after him. And in distribution thereof in this congregation, should inquiries be made of the poor among them, and support provided during the time of their convention, and it should be distributed amongst them. Also in this congregation should be made common prayer, such as all men hearing might understand, that the hearts of all, subscribing, footnote, agreeing, end footnote, to the voice of one, might, with unfeigned and fervent mind, say, Amen. Whosoever withdraws himself from such a congregation, but alas, where shall it be found, he declares himself to be no member of Christ's body. For whom and at what time we should pray. Now there remains for whom and at what time we should pray. Paul commands that we should pray for all men and at all times, and principally for such of the household of faith as suffer persecution, and for commonwealths tyrannically pressed, 
incessantly should we call, that God of his mercy and power will withstand the violence of such tyrants. God's sentence may be changed, and when we see the plagues of God as hunger, pestilence, or war coming, or appearing at hand, then should we with lamentable voices and repenting hearts call unto God that it would please his infinite mercies to withdraw his hand, which thing, if we do unfeignedly, he will without doubt revoke his wrath, and in the midst of his anger think upon mercy, as we are taught in the scripture, by his infallible and eternal verity. As in Exodus God saith, I shall destroy this nation from the face of the earth, and when Moses addressed himself to pray for them, the Lord proceeded, saying, Suffer me, that I may utterly destroy them. And then Moses falleth down upon his face, and forty days continued in prayer for the safety of the people, for whom at the last he obtained forgiveness. David, in the vehement plague, lamentably called unto God, and the king of Nineveh saith, Who can tell God may turn and repent, and cease from his fierce wrath, that we perish not? Which examples and scriptures are not written in vain, but to certify us that God, of his own nature and goodness, will mitigate his plagues by our prayers offered by Jesus Christ, although he has threatened to punish, or even now doth punish which he testifies by his own words, saying, If I have prophesied against any nation or people that they shall be destroyed, if they repent of their iniquity, it shall repent me of the evil which I have spoken against them. This I write, lamenting the great coldness of men, who under such long scourges of God are nothing kindled to pray by repentance, but carelessly sleep in a wicked life, even as though the continual wars, urgent famine, and daily plagues of pestilence, and other contagious, insolent, and strange maladies, were not the present signs of God's wrath provoked by our iniquities. A plague threatened to England. O England, that thy intestine battle and domestic murder provoke thee to purity of life, according to the word which openly hath been proclaimed in thee, otherwise thou shalt drink the cup of the Lord's wrath. The multitude shall not escape, but shall drink the dregs, and have the cup broken upon their heads. For judgment beginneth in the house of the Lord, and commonly the least offender is first punished, to excite the more wicked to repentance. But, O Lord, infinite in mercy, if thou shalt punish, make not consummation, but cut away the proud and luxuriant branches which bear no fruit, and preserve the commonwealths of such as give succour and harbour to thy contemned messengers, which long have suffered exile in deserts. And let thy kingdom shortly come, that sin may be ended, and death devoured, that sin may be ended, death devoured, thy enemies confounded, that we, thy people, being delivered by thy majesty, may obtain everlasting joy and felicity, through Jesus Christ our Saviour, to whom be all honour and praise for ever. Amen. Hasten, Lord, and tarry not. John Knox. End of A Treatise on Prayer by John Knox.